Hello, fellow foodies. This week on Foodie Pharmacology, I speak with Pavlos Georgiadis, a research associate at the Department of Societal Transition and Agriculture at the University of Hoheim in Germany. Pavlos is an ethnobotanist and an international consultant in the areas of resilient development, agriculture and climate policy, and biodiversity conservation, with experience across the public, private, and civil society sectors in 20 countries in Europe, Asia, and America. His research focuses on the ethnobotany of mountain communities in the Indian, Himalaya, and Southeast Asia, and the utilization of indigenous plant and farming knowledge for ecosystem restoration and sustainable development. He's been doing some really cool work in the scope of slow, f- slow food in Greece, documenting traditional and heirloom products and exploring local crop varieties. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Pablo. It's great to see you. Thanks, Cassandra. I have been following your podcast for uh, some time and I'm really excited. And thank you very much for your invitation. Great, great to be with you. Oh, well, awesome. Well, I'm I'm really curious if you can tell us a bit about your work in ethnobotany and all the different applications you have um, for ethnobotany, maybe starting with ecosystem restoration. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess my entry point was uh, plant taxonomy itself. Mm-hmm. I'm a graduate from the Royal of the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. Uh, the Plant Biodiversity and Taxonomy Masters that was something like 15 years ago, which really was an eye opener and really introduced me into this, you know, interesting craft and science of alpha taxonomy. And also that was the time where, uh, you know, molecular uh, work and, you know, the angiosperm phylogeny group was really taking off and uh, that and that that really sparked and inspired me to get into you know the world of biodiversity exploration um exploring the wonderful and magnificent world of plants exploring and explaining the world of plants um then i have moved to the university of hohenheim for a second masters on environmental protection and agricultural food production that was in the mid uh, uh, 2000s this was the time where, you know, the conflict between, you know, food security, agricultural land use and forest use started really emerging and becoming more mainstream into the scientific um, discourse. And I had the chance to do field work in uh, the Indian Himalayan uh, belt and Southeast Asia in uh, Thailand and Southwest China. Um, but having a, a, an entry point into ethnobotany in an agricultural university, in the social sciences of agriculture, with a plant taxonomy background, really created this interesting mix of trying to investigate uses and practices around plants, not um, through a strictly utilitarian lens, Mm -hmm. i.e. discovery of molecules or products, but more about exploring uh, the type of potential that exists in those human-plant relationships in order to um, help um, uh, foster self-directed development, sustainable development, you know, that improves livelihoods, improves the diets of people, improves the knowledge with their immediate resource. And obviously through the years, and now as we are entering the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, this has a very, very important role to play in terms of, you know, prioritizing species, for large-scale ecosystem restoration in a way that doesn't only take into account ecological criteria, i.e. species that need to be planted in the right place in the right time, but also uh, considers also cultural importance and cultural criteria, social criteria, in a way that those restoration efforts also provide some sort of incentive for those rural community, most of the times really marginalized, isolated, Mm -hmm communities provide incentives so they can really nourish and and protect those uh, restoration efforts. That's great. And so is is this work in restoration tied to food security or would you say it's more tied to food sovereignty? 
Well, I guess it's a bit of both. Obviously, food sovereignty and food security go hand in hand mm -hmm. because there is so much, um, like there are so many powers uh, <laughs> acting on land, especially productive and fertile land and biodiverse land. And sometimes these type of powers are conflicting. So one really has to consider land rights, human rights, you know, the, 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 the rights of indigenous people, of our knowledge and over the land itself. And, you know, traditionally there has always been a conflict between, you know, governments uh, wanting to exclude human presence versus human communities that have been mm -hmm. there even in times older than the, the governments themselves. <laughs> so... And obviously, there you know there has in the most biodiverse, rich places of the planet. Usually, there is overpopulation. There is mm -hmm. uh, there are governance gaps. Uh, there is even corruption. Um, and you know, all those really are asking for a fresh look and a new mindset towards approaching. So, yes, foods uh, are very important. Not only because the you know wild foods and and traditional food knowledge you know plant knowledge um, controls a large part of the diets of these uh, indigenous people since centuries, mm -hmm. but also in the context of designing the foods of the future, creating the foods foods of the future. If you consider that our diets uh, are are based on a very narrow range of species, uh, and how yeah. this connects with the syndemic which is, has been around before the pandemic. <laughs> the, the, you know, the communicable COVID disease we had. We had obesity, we have all those uh, uh, um, uh, non-communicable diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and so on, that are connected with bad food. Mm -hmm. So there are crops uh, that have been uh, forming the life systems of uh, of, of rural communities for many, many centuries. And those crops are largely, many of those crops, the majority of those crops remain largely undocumented. They're unknown, they're underutilized. It's a really an untapped resource. So if we are looking towards securing um, food for uh, you know the world of the 10 billion or the 9 billion by 20, yeah. we really need to be looking to more you know, climate resilient crops, to more nutritious crops, mm -hmm. or better value per hectare type of crops. Obviously not through genetic engineering, but more through biodiversity based productive systems. And, you know, this obviously brings into discussion the whole issue about food sovereignty, mm -hmm. uh, inevitably. Well, I know you've you've done a lot of work also um, in the realm of slow food, and I know you have a particular fascination with local varieties of crops, um, also in Greece. Can you tell us a bit about that? What why are why is the diversity of of, of these varieties important um, to to local people and and to health in general? Sure. Well, my my particular passion is uh, indigenous olive varieties. Mm. I had the privilege and the happiness the, to, to grow up in an in indigenous traditional olive grove on the northeastern coast of Greece. We have a local variety there. It's one of the northeast distributions of olives. Uh, we are talking about plants which are close to 1,000-year-old, like really, wow. really genotype. Uh, and this must have been like, you know, the land bridge between Syria, which is the, the mother, the, the mother mm. place of olives, and how they spread uh, to the rest of the Mediterranean and so on. So um, quite interesting uh, point. But then um, Greece in particular, like most of the Mediterranean, is a center of, uh, of mm -hmm. diversity, is, uh, is, a, is a hotspot, is a biodiversity hotspot, especially also because of its high degree of endemism, in particular mm -hmm. Greece, all those, you know, thousands of islands, you can imagine over the, the wow. over the millennia, the, the degree of speciation taking place there with, you know, the, this polymorphic geography. Um, obviously, those, uh, these, these diversity is reflected on the biodiversity and the agri-biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And now there is enough proof that, you know, the scientific evidence suggests that there are certain crops and certain varieties that have a higher nutritional value than the traditional or commercialized crops. 
crops that can complement with higher um, micro, higher levels of micronutrients that we would otherwise not have readily available from the foods that we find in a supermarket. So the possibility to be able to grow all this bounty of diversity, but also to be able to differentiate in terms of taste, colors, smells, mm. just make it much more interesting. Now, in the context of Greece, uh, you might know like Greece is has had a very pervasive financial crisis over the last 10 years. The country has lost one third of its GDP, mm. irrespective of whether this is the right indicator to measure uh, prosperity, but it is a measure. Uh, we had a lot of people losing their jobs and a massive wave of people going back to the land and rediscovering those type of traditional agricultural systems like home gardens, family gardens, family mm -hmm. farms, and so on. Um, How and difficult is that, um, Pablo? So I, I, I've spoken about traditional ecological knowledge with my class. I mean, this is a major topic for discussion um, in my class on food and health. And, you know, there can be a loss of traditional knowledge sometimes to where it's very difficult to reclaim those practices. Um, it's not as simple as just going back to the countryside. How have how have people reclaimed this knowledge? Are there still is it still very robust in the elder population? Are the elders teaching the younger generations again? Well, this also depends on country and context. Um, mm -hmm. I I had the chance to observe this type of oral tradition or oral transfer happening in Southeast Asia and in India, but also mm -hmm. more recently in Greece. Um, I think this takes place up to a certain extent. But you know, in my frank opinion, I've also seen a lot of elder people, older people, really, you know, practicing very very unsustainably. Ah. So, uh, you know, because in the, the the previous generation, the immediate previous generation had, had just had different priorities, uh, and uh, you know the the productivist system of agriculture where you had to produce more for less, mm -hmm. uh, because the priorities were different back in the 1930s when you know those type of mindsets have came across came across, um, and sometimes it can be difficult for a younger a farmer or a younger person to just show up in the village and say, hey, we need to start caring about the soil again and we need to start <laughs> caring about the climate emissions, the, you know, the greenhouse emissions and so on. So this is, there's always an interesting struggle there. So I'm not sure, I, I think this knowledge transfer is, is uh, reciprocal. So mm -hmm. elders might be passing some um, information and some experience that comes from the past. But I think what is extremely interesting and also largely uh, under research is the type of knowledge that young people are bringing to their villages and their communities. And in particular, for example, the, the you know, the boom of permaculture, for example, mm. agroecology and how this is getting more and more mainstream. This is from one side, something novel into a rural communities, but on the other side, it also reminds of a different, simpler, slower past. Um, and uh, it's certainly a, a very interesting uh, time for this wave of, uh, you know, reconciling the relationship with the land. Obviously, there are at the same times very, very strong forces applied from the top. Mm -hmm. the for one, <laughs> for once. But um, I think uh, on the other side, the, you know, this dialogue has never been so intense. We see now um, uh, cities, uh, you know, urban, you know, municipalities and, you know, regional governments getting into play and looking closer into nature-based solutions, into, you know, mm. urban gardening. Uh, we see architects designing spaces in a completely different way and much more... Oh more rural, urban people um, discussing about public space and how this can be used for greening, recreation, but also for food. And there, it is an interesting entry point for all those heirloom traditional varieties. You will see that the percentage of, 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 of urban gardens, the percentage of indigenous varieties in urban gardens is also very high. And this hmm. is something that no one would have thought 10 or five years ago. Yeah. 
Well, and can you tell us a bit more about these these varieties? What types of crops are we talking about? Are these um, seasonal vegetables? Are they grapevines? Are they olive trees? What are what are people really becoming more invested in? Mm -hmm. I think that the vegetable varieties are, at least here in the Mediterranean, is, is there there is there is a, a very intense um, interest. Mm -hmm. uh, this also relate. This is also related with the diverse diet and the culinary traditions. Uh, but I think what we have seen in the last 10, 15 years is vibrant seed swapping networks of people mm. sending each other their seeds, most of the times for free. So this emerges also as an alternative currency, um, which I believe is quite groundbreaking in the context of you know global resilience, climate resilience, and so on. I think people are very much attracted to colors and, and flavors and, and smells, but they are slowly also discovering the nutritional benefits of shifting towards such a diet. And this is obviously something that needs time to be mm -hmm. observed, but I also think it's very important because this type of, of, of uh, gardening and this type of uh, growing is also very attractive for children. So we have mm -hmm. a school gardens and, you know, I think we are, we are escaping this, um, this, this essentially, you know, sad circumstances where things, uh, children thought that potatoes grow in trees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or cows are purple <laughs> in the, because of TV commercials and so on. So we have a new interest. And I think this is, you know, uh, everything might look a little bit gloomy and everything, uh, but I think there is a certain degree of hope. Obviously, in certain countries, at least here in Europe, we also have an intense interest in, in, in cereals, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, different... Uh, uh, varieties of, of wheat and uh, different corns and pseudo cereals, amaranth is coming back, um, buckwheat, all those nutritionally superior um, crops that, you know, I, I didn't have them in my food 10 years ago. And now yeah. you can easily either grow or just go and, and the, the supply exists. Yeah. So, um, and I, I think that the whole, you know, pandemic and how the public health systems and governance structures have been struggling with the realities mm -hmm. has given the opportunity to individuals and communities in both cities and villages to rethink and uh, to rethink radically in terms of the production consumption system. Um, and this is where I believe that traditional foods, varieties, traditional medicine also uh, is coming into play. And um, I think, I hope that this will be what will stay as part of the new normal. It won't be only less freedom to move and so on, but it will also be a new awareness about, you know, the biodiversity and the life support systems that have been, you know, getting us going for, for centuries, for, for, for millennia. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I, I wonder how all this ties into the way that we eat, our social structure of food consumption. Um, this is another aspect of the Mediterranean diet. I mean, the Mediterranean diet is characterized by these very fresh ingredients, very vegetable heavy, olive oil, um, seafood, um, a lot of bitter vegetables, I think, as well, bitter wild greens. Um, but what else can we learn about the ways that people eat? And again, many of the members of our audience are in the United States where it's not uncommon for us to eat on the run, right? There's this the the idea of fast food, you know, eating just to to fill our stomachs and keep going. How does this differ from the Mediterranean diet? Yeah, I think it boils down to how much time we spend with mm -hmm. subject food and, uh, you know, how much time in terms, you know, to think about sourcing, provenance, a way of growing, way of cooking. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot, of nutrients, a lot of nutrients are being lost during cooking. And then also during bad cooking. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it inevitably also brings, uh, you know, the, the 
whole question about waste and, and you know, yes. sustainably mm-hmm. managing it in a way uh, that, uh, you know, that at some point this topic of food start makes sense <laughs> because, mm-hmm. you know, like when we are talking about food deserts, when we are talking about, mm-hmm. you know, diets mm-hmm. that are based on solely industrial products, then at some point it doesn't really make sense. It doesn't even make economic sense. It only it is only cheaper because these type of foods are heavily subsidized. Yes, which then also brings into question the whole agri food policy, um, you know, environment. And but again, here we see a shift in the ambition in the last years. We have, you know, the Paris Agreement, and thank God the U.S. is back on it. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's only like you know five six year old type of policies, and certainly the ambition. Uh, exists, but in order for them to 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 achieve their environmental and you know carbon aspirations, uh, they will have to start promoting healthier, lo- more local, more sustainable, more seasonal. The truth is that us, even in the Mediterranean, we still have high rates of um, obesity rates. We still have, you know, in our generation, at least one meal is consumed outside. Uh, mm the how you know the the, the house mm-hmm. so that is bought food purchased food um then of course you know uh, we still want to have our coffee and our avocados and you know then <laughs> you know no one should you know forbid people from having such pleasures but if we are to have such pleasures i think we should pay a little bit more attention so at least those um uh, foods those products don't ruin the lives somewhere else in the world yeah i I think you know this this oneness that 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 uh, this whole discussion about food can bring into our communities into our societies can potentially have a transformative power we see that at the neighborhood level we see that at the city level and, you know, this is the value of, like, you know, those global food movements. Uh, mm-hmm. The value, I also think, of those, you know, massive efforts that happen at the top level, like those UN decades for small farmers, uh, you know, uh, biodiversity decades, um, ecosystem restoration decades. It means that there are long-term goals mm-hmm. that need to be reached in order to ensure that we can go on surviving. Now, when we're talking about global goals and objective, the goals themselves are not hypocritical. The people <laughs> that are asked to fulfill those goods might be hypocritical. That's why it is very important that those goals and those processes and those people are owned by communities, by the majority, not just by the usual suspects, mm. are not having citizens' nutrition or environmental health as their top priority, they have financial gain as the top priority. So we need yeah. to find balance. And the more knowledge we discover, the more knowledge we disseminate and share openly, I think this awareness is is is, is bringing this balance to our societies. And, you know, this is also forming part of my own inquiry into societal transition and agriculture, because... Agriculture can potentially have a big negative impact, but it can also potentially have a positive impact. Absolutely. Well, I, I, I think as you're speaking, I, I kept thinking in my mind, you know, that many of us are unaware of where in the world our foods come from. When we see those um, tomatoes on the, you know, in the produce area, um, in the during winter, um, I think most of us don't don't recognize. Well, that comes from another warmer climate on another side of the globe, and how how the movement of foods and the 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 cost um, of movement, not just economic, but also to to um, the climate and to you know the like you said the situations under which um, the people that that grow those crops um, are under in some cases can be quite bad. I'd like to talk a little bit more about climate change and sustainability actions. Um, from your work in this in this field, what are some of the the major movements happening now to push us towards more of a sustainable um, path for for agriculture? 
Mm -hmm. Indeed, this question about, you know, where was my food last night is mm. something that has been occupied, you know, at least our generation, like for the last, let's say, 10 years or so, in some countries more, more intensely, but in some other societies it's just uh, coming now. An interesting example is Brexit. And, mm. you know, like a country that, you know, I think more than 80% of its agriculture is barley and and uh, and and uh, dairy mm -hmm. you know barley for whiskey and and uh, <laughs> and beer and so mm -hmm. on but then you know suddenly they're out of the eu they cannot as easily import uh, you know um um vegetables that they would have otherwise import from spain from greece from southern europe mm -hmm. and, you know, much more easily and then you know the food system starts thinking that there has to be a, a shift in land use towards horticulture and it has to happen in a way that it doesn't have, you know, a big land and climate footprint and so on. So you can imagine that, like, you know, this is how political changes can 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 be reflected on the actual land use. And when we are talking about biodiversity, conservation and exploration, land use is, uh, you know, yeah. the elephant in the room. <laughs> you have to address that. So um, besides provenance, I think um, the whole issue about the footprint, water, carbon, is also something that is largely being reflected mm -hmm. in the price as well. And it's not only about, you know, plant foods, plant-based foods, but also, you know, if you take meat, for example, and you, we all know the, the devastating effects of, of, of uh, large-scale cattle, cattle raising in South mm -hmm. America or palm oil. In, in, yes. uh, in Southeast Asia, you know, palm oil is everywhere. Uh, children go to school and, you know, the time they go to the shop to buy a snack, they have, a, you know, their portion of palm oil 10 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And we know that this type of, you know, industrial, it, it, you know, it's cheap fat, essentially. And we know that fat is bad for the health. I mean, it's not that it's bad, but excess fat. Excess, especially yeah especially when when you know this is produced in a devastating way for you know the, the flora and the fauna of the places of origin uh, with all the consequences that brings which are not only ecological there are also um, you know life uh, impacts on the livelihoods of the people mm -hmm. um so a lot of people are are shifting um, their their uh, attitude, their habits, their food habits. We have a surge of vegetarians and vegans that do not only they connect they connect their personal own health and diet with the wider environmental health. On the other side, we have arguments that uh, that that speak about the advantages of animals in agriculture. Animals have been an integral part of agricultural and farming systems since ever because they have a benefit in terms of enriching the soil um you know yes and, but never and, never consumed quite at the levels that we currently consume animal protein i mean it's always a part but often for production of dairy and and cheeses and yogurts and some meat but um this is yeah, now our, our levels of meat consumption are just higher than they've ever been historically. And it's also, and I think it's a big success, marketing success of the meat industry. Like now you go to a cafeteria and you can have like a kilo steak. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, like that, the space, the space, just the space where food is consumed, in particular mm -hmm. unsustainable food is, 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 is uh, consumed, is really mind blowing. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, obviously now there is a, a change in the restoration, in, uh, you know, sector in the hospitality sector. Things kind of, or at least seemingly, slowed down. But uh, we, we, I think, like you know, this unprecedented challenge of COVID and the pandemic is definitely an opportunity to 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 draw some some lessons. And we are gonna have to wait and see if there is actually going to be any positive impact on the production consumption. Um, 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 practices by sh for sure when we are talking about zoonotic uh, diseases and that like thousands of people and you know almost every economy of the world is devastated because of you know eating the wrong type of meat or you know not that there is wrong but eating contaminated meat yeah I, I think or eating contaminated food in general 
it is a blatant example of you know something is not happening along the way. Yeah. And, um, hopefully we 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 have we still have enough um, active cells within our societies and our communities that really can act as a social immune system to this large disease of unsustainable food habits that has an impact on the land, that has an impact on biodiversity, not only in terms of habitats, but also in terms of a resource that yeah. be tapped in a way that we feed in into the health and the nutrition and the prosperity of people, both in the places of production and consumption, but also giving back and leaving something back for the environment and for the ecosystem. Now, the for the future and for the future, right? We're we're killing our own future right now. And here the challenge is: how can we best make this without sounding too experty? Mm. And you know, the grand designers that we have the solution <laughs> that we try to enforce. And, you know, the challenge here is how to 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 uh, lay the argument in a way that people understand or at least are part of this understanding, this transition, and they don't feel that they sacrifice something of their own freedom or rights. Mm -hmm. So don't be surprised that our whole discussion also has to do with psychology, has to do with behavioral sciences, has to do with you know, social and cultural and behavioral change. So I think that us as explorers of plant biodiversity who have a very important work to do in the forest, in the laboratory, in front of our computers, in front of microphones, in lecture theaters, we have a say, we have a role to play in the policy discourse, in, 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 in the economy, in those, um, you know, in those processes that are trying to keep the balance in an ever increasing population and ever diminishing resources. And I would like, I, I, that's why I think it is particular exciting times for, you know, plant sciences in general, mm -hmm. but ethnobotany in particular, you know, we have always been a tiny community and uh, yeah. it's encouraging that, you know, this is expanding and, you know, it is people like you who are doing this dissemination work and, you know, you know, the type of teaching and public engagement about this. I think it's very, very important. It is part of the science and the craft. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I admire your work so much in in policy engagement because I think I think this is where we have to go as a field in ethnobotany. Is this is you know our our work is has to be about more than just another scientific research article that other experts in our field read. We have to think about how do we how do we use this knowledge? How do we use the findings of this area of science to improve upon the world? Um, I think our you know, in my opinion, our industrial agricultural system is a very unnatural, very, you know, dare I say toxic system. We rely on antimicrobials in, you know, in, in both our animal production, whether it be fish or cattle, we have um, massive amounts of antifungals that are pumped into the environment with our vegetables as well. Um, I think, of, for example, even for cut flowers, if you think about tulips and the spray of antifungals, and we now have, you know, horrifically drug-resistant strains of aspergillus that affect, you know, infect people's lungs. And so this, this manipulation of the system in such a way to allow for very dense monoculture is really dangerous. I think it's really dangerous both for public health now and, and into the future. Um, and I think it is, it's exciting to see um, future directions and awareness around climate change and sustainability because we have to, we have to make change, but it takes a long time. As you well know, these are not quick fixes, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. well, the truth is that we have a surge of knowledge that is being mainstreamed into practice. It might be slow, but it's coming. Mm -hmm. And um, it's inevitably, maybe it comes through urban centers first, hmm. uh, because this is where people interested about this happen to congregate, but inevitably this will spread out. And this doesn't only take place into the, you know, rich parts of the world, but also, you know, in the South, in developing countries. 
There are some amazing ecosystem restoration projects that now, after 10, 12, 15 years, start to mature. You know, the canopy starts closing and the ecosystem services of these plants need uh, are, are coming in. We have, you know, over the last three, four years, a great body of scientific literature that has been published mm -hmm. on the insights of what is working and what is not. You know, the you know documentation of pioneer species, keystone species approaches that really are able to really reintroduce biodiversity gradually. Um, and, um, you know, that we are talking essentially about biodiversity-based productivity. Mm -hmm. We're talking about systems that don't only grow one crop or two, three crops rotating, but systems that grow 20 crops. Yeah. 100 crops, you know. Uh, when I was in China, I was doing field work in China, 10 years ago, we were working on a system called rainforestation farming from rainforest and reforestation. And it was essentially a three-dimensional farm. And you really need to start thinking of it as an architect. You know, you build the mm. pillars of, of your construct. It's your keystone species, your, your early pioneer species who will grow fast, will produce a canopy, will shadow, will overshadow the, you know, all the weeds that are uh, gregarious. And then you know, they will start restore the, restoring the ecosystem service, uh, services, the soil moisture, they will attract the pollinators, they will attract seed dispersers. And then, you know, you have the second level, uh, you know, shadow loving, uh, middle height, lower canopy bushes and plants that produce fiber and nuts and fruits and, you know, utility, everyday utility for the local populations, but also high value commodities for markets like orchids, like horticultural mm. plants, mushrooms, uh, bees. You know, the idea is there of putting into, into practice all these traditional knowledge that exists, not only for it to stay in a paper or in an ethnobotanical inventory, mm -hmm. which we can extract an X number of molecules, rightly so, but also in a way that we can um, we can we can use them in order to rehabilitate formerly degraded landscapes, both ecologically but also economically, mm -hmm. because we see that where the monocultures took place in the last 50, 60 years, in especially poorer countries, we saw a devastation not only of the forests, we saw a devastation of the economies and the livelihoods of people. We saw the farmer suicides in India due to the seemingly green revolution. Mm -hmm. We saw the impacts in the groundwater and the livelihoods in Southwest China and the Golden Triangle in you know, the, the Southeastern Peninsula with the rubber plantations. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are only strictly approaching this through an economic lens, then yes, this is profitable. Then we have to ask profitable to whom? To whom, yes. Mm -hmm. but, then, but then if we start, you know, really looking into a different me metrics, like, you know, the rate of cancers in mm -hmm. the local population, the rate of debt, who owns the debt, who are the decision makers, and so on, then, you know, us as thoughtful people, uh, we start, you know, there are, there are some red flags that are being raised around mm -hmm. the way. And, you know, I'm not entirely sure if we are living in moments where we are doing pro where we are making progress or we are backsliding, but I know that the world has never been worse, but has also never been better <laughs> today. You know, and this is how we need to take it and to try to pull as many resources and as much support as we can in order to recruit more researchers doing the actual job. We have some amazing tools, uh, even you know, machine learning algorithms, open databases, mm -hmm. amazing retrieval systems. I think us botanists have the most precious resource, which is collaboration. Yes. <laughs> if there is a scientific uh, community that collaborates, then this is botanists traditionally, and I think this is uh, this is this is this is important. Maybe we need to put a little bit more effort into community engagement, into making a case, into, you know, playing our part where foresters or engineers or economists have their own part. There mm -hmm. is a seat on the table for plant ecologists, for botanists, for ethnobotanists. So this is something where we should also focus. That's great. You know? Well 
What what advice do you have, Pablo, for students that might be interested in in, in engaging in the plant sciences or have a, a passion for sustainability research or climate change research? Um, what advice would you offer to them? Mm. I would say let's first get the botany right, right? Mm -hmm. like, you know, mm -hmm. have the foundation of ground knowledge on plant taxonomy, uh, at least the basics. Mm -hmm. uh, I, this is so fundamental in order to start making things about reading the landscape. Um, yeah. I, I'm exercising plant taxonomy in my kitchen <laughs> out of the hobby. You know, it's really a transformative um, a discipline. And if you are also on the altruistic side of life, then you will also find it can be a very, very purposeful and, and rewarding life purpose. You know, because, you know, at the end, you're doing this for, for humanity, mm -hmm. you know. So I would say, yeah, don't be afraid about all these complex Latin names, nomenclature. <laughs> you know, it, is, it is a language. People learn foreign languages, new languages. It's a language that we can learn. Then I would say, you know, start with something simple, like a balcony. <laughs> <laughs> or, a, or a back garden and plant something and you might not be successful at the beginning but you at least start observing what works and what not it will mm -hmm. get out there every day to observe how the sun falls on that spot or how the soil behaves and what type of biodiversity it attracts just just keep it real yeah. and the third yeah. one is I would say find a piece of land on the earth, find a place on the earth that really inspires you and you want to, affect, to, 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 make, to, to have a positive impact on, try to go and study. I, I think um, for the new generation of uh, field researchers, they are going to have a much, much easier time to pull resources to go out there and do field work compared to 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. So it's a great opportunity. And um, I think that especially for early career researchers, younger people, like, you know, graduates, postgraduates, it's an amazing thing to go out there and dedicate your life to do. I couldn't think of anything better. <laughs> so, yeah, I, it, it can be a very rewarding uh, experience. Uh, it can be become much more than a job. Actually, most of the time, it doesn't look like a job because it doesn't pay very good sometimes. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's, it's definitely a very, very rewarding. And, um, you know, the people around you will notice. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much, Pablos, for coming on the show. This has been an enlightening conversation. And um, it's just great to think about the, the bigger picture of planetary health and how this ties to our own health and food systems. Thank you. I'm really happy I was able to add my bit to this discussion through uh, your podcast. And um, it's an exciting series. And uh, I'm always uh, learning something new and also getting to know the, the people. I think it's a great format of communication. And um, all the best and good luck for it. Thank you. You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious, recorded today on Skype. If you'd like to access this episode and others, you can find them at our website, which is foodiepharmacology.com. You can also find the video version of this episode and others at the My Teach Ethnobotany YouTube channel under the Foodie Pharmacology playlist. I want to give a big thanks to the producers, Rob Cohen and Christine Roth from Co-Conspiracy Entertainment. You can find them at coconspiracy.tv or their publishing house, Rothko Press. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there and I'll see you next time.